Father, we praise you and thank you that you have the words of eternal life. Praise you and thank you. We get to sing these lyrics. We get to believe these truths. We've even heard three testimonies of those who have been saved by your truth, by your gospel, by your work, by your atonement, receiving your salvation, receiving your righteousness, living according to your wisdom, empowered by your strength, so marvelously working through them. And so we thank you for every opportunity we get to see your son, to see your glory, and to see your truth. And we pray that as we direct our attention to your truth in these remaining moments, that you would indeed glorify your son and strengthen our hearts with faith. We pray this simply for the glory that you richly deserve and for the benefit that we would actually render to our brothers and sisters in this body when you work through us as we respond rightly to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. We'll take a seat, and uh, with the remaining few minutes we have, I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and open up to Mark chapter 5. Um, we are going to uh, continue, we're actually going to be looking at chapter 6, but we're going to look at what uh, Mark has been documenting for us by way of faith in this next story. And the story we're going to be devoting our time to is found in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6a. And as you're looking, you're turning over to, and I'm going to kind of make some connections to 4, 5, and 6, but as you're making your way there to the Gospel of Mark, it's just, it's just incredible, isn't it, hearing these testimonies that we just heard? I mean, every time, and we get, you know, two, two times a year, we schedule a, a baptism service, and on a morning like this, we get to hear even the overflow, uh, just because there's just, uh, the Lord's doing such an incredible work. And hearing the Lord, what he's done in the lives of these believers is overwhelming. And sometimes, if you're like me, each time you hear a testimony, and even in this case, um, you know, knowing uh, uh, at least two of the three, I'd already heard the testimony, uh, he, even hearing the same particular story of how God saved them is still shocking and it's still remarkable. And in fact, what was interesting about those three testimonies that we heard this morning, uh, and you think about um, Jeremy and Lori and, and Alex, all three growing up with a religious background, all three of them having um, an, enough knowledge of truth, if you will, to kind of get by externally. There, there's a sense where even those circumstances are primed from a natural perspective to make faith next to impossible. When it comes to fearing man, when it comes to fitting into a, in a, a, a religious family or a semi-religious organization, if they wanted to attend church, they know how to navigate that. Uh, there's just, everything would be against them to actually believe in a saving way. And yet, they, they were saved. They believed. And it's just shocking to see how the Lord brings them through uh, certain trials or certain, certain exposures. And as you heard them describe certain points in their life where suddenly the, the veil kind of came off and their own self-deception uh, was over and they began believing what the scripture says about them. Um, it's just shocking. Have you ever asked um, the question, is God shocked? Is God shocked by those testimonies? Now, of course, we know God's not shocked by the fact that they were up here testifying. He's not shocked that they're saved. He's not shocked that they believed. He determined from the foundation of the world to save these three and make them our uh, brothers and sister in Christ. And so, no, he's not shocked in the sense that, no, he's not surprised by the, the future. There's a, he's, he's not surprised by anything he's determined from the beginning before he carries it into fruition. We are, as we watch a sovereign God do what he alone does, but no, he's not shocked in that sense. What's interesting, though, is the scriptures also testify that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was shocked on a couple of very interesting occasions. One example of Jesus being shocked is found in Mark uh, Matthew, I'm going to start with Matthew. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, and just stick in, stay in Mark for a second. I'm going to jump around for a bit. Listen to this example of Jesus' shock and astonishment, and listen to what he is marveling at. 
and I'm just going to read a verse to you. I, I dove into a passage. I dove into a story about um, the faith of a centurion. And so obviously a centurion is a Roman soldier. He's a Gentile. And listen to what happens. He actually responds to Jesus in a particular way. Jesus uh, says to the centurion about his servant who was, who was paralyzed. Jesus says to the centurion, I'm going to come and heal him. To that line, the centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word. My servant will be healed. I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, he, he, he goes. I say to another one, come, he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. So the centurion is acknowledging he's a man of pretty high level of authority in the Roman military, and he's asking Jesus to heal one of his servants, and he recognizes Jesus' authority to such a degree that he says, you don't have to show up, Jesus. Just All you have to do is just say the word. I believe in your authority. You have the authority to say this, to do this. Just say the word, and it's enough. Now, Jesus heard this. Matthew says, he marveled. And just soak that in for a moment. The Son of God marveled. This is the Son of God, jaw hitting the floor with shock, impressed, overwhelmed, astounded. Marveling has a, is a verb that kind of has the idea of beholding something that's so shocking it's hard to take in. Jesus, in this text and in the parallel text in Luke chapter 7, verse 9, Luke says the same thing. Jesus marveled. He was shocked. He was astounded, dumbfounded. Wow. Look at this faith. This is incredible. The Son of God was astounded at faith. We're in a text in Mark chapter 6. It's coming on the heels of a lot of narratives that we've been looking at over the last several weeks and months, narratives that have been giving us example after example of individuals who should have believed and were fear fearful or did believe and were able to avoid being fearful. And we get to a text where this is the only text in the entire Gospel of Mark where Jesus is astounded. This is the only text in the entire gospel, as Mark tells the story, where the Son of God is shocked. And you know what he finds most shocking? In this instance, it's the opposite of Matthew 8 in Luke 7. He's shocked at unbelief. In this story we're about to read, Jesus expresses a marvel, a shock, an astonishment at the fact that there are people in his hometown, his, around Nazareth. This would have been just southwest of where most of the story has been taking place as we follow through the book of Mark. He's going home. He's in Nazareth. Uh, he even went to the synagogue that was there, according to Luke chapter 4. He's opening up scripture. He's teaching truth on that one particular Sabbath. He even preaches the book of Isaiah chapter 61, says this is fulfilled in your midst right now. And he is shocked that people would be exposed to him and his teaching, his word, and they don't believe. This just makes Christ marvel. I, I, I feel like a real responsibility this morning to just Im hopefully impress upon you what's been impressed upon me this week. We shouldn't be able to walk away from this text without being able to say from the bottom of our heart, my unbelief blows my mind. We should benefit from what Christ is shocked at here. And we should find the, the, the preposterous thought that a creature could hear the words of the God who created us and not believe it or even remain neutral, or rise up with the audacity to think that we have a right to judge whether it's true or not, or to imagine whether it's trustworthy, or to gauge if it was stated too strongly, 
or if it went too far, or it stopped too short. This should shock us. This story really shows us the shocking reality of unbelief. Let's uh, just, just follow along with me as I read verse 1 through 6. Mark writes this, Jesus went out from there and he came into his hometown. And his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Verse 6a is the end of a major section in the book of Mark. Chapters 1 through 8 really shows this shocking identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. And shockingly enough, it seems like nobody gets it except the demons. As, he works, as Mark works through this section showing how shocking Jesus' identity really is, he begins in, verses, in chapters 1 through 3 documenting the unbelief of the religious leaders. And then from 3, 7 all the way through to this verse, 6, 6a, he's documenting the unbelief of the people, the people in the nation. And he's just documenting how they respond. And of course, we saw them respond back in chapter 3, even the hometown crowd, especially those his biological family and those from Nazareth, those are from his hometown, they come over to the Sea of Galilee to kind of lend a helping hand, to help out Christ, if you will, because they were concerned that Jesus had gone too far. And so they're they're actually thinking he's lost his senses and we're going to help him out. Um, he's going to get himself in trouble and he needs us. By the time you get to chapter 6, verse 6, it becomes very clear. They're looking at Jesus and they think he's just gone a little too far. He's kind of a lunatic. And they think that they're actually more loyal to Jesus than the religious leaders who are calling him a liar and a blasphemer. But this isn't saving faith. They don't believe. They're put off. The story in verses 1 through 2a is very simple. As far as a story, how do you how to tell a story? There's about four action points. Just Jesus goes, goes into the hometown, his disciples follow, he begins to teach, and people listen. And that's the story. Everything else in this story is theological color commentary to make sense of the significance of what's happening. And it's actually very important that Mark puts it at the end of the section on the unbelief of the people. And starting in chapter 6, 6b, all the way through to the middle of chapter 8, he's going to start showing the struggle in the disciples, the twelve, as they are actually struggling to believe Christ, and they're battling fear and unbelief all the way through up to chapter 8, verse 21. And so it's actually very important that we give it about four verses of theological color commentary here from the end of verse 2 all the way through 6a and that's all to document that this loyal sort of friendly concern about Jesus going too far is absolutely as damning as the unbelief of the religious leadership that calls him satanic. It's the same. Circumstantially there's differences There's different fallout, maybe some different consequences, temporally speaking. But neither are saving. And so, look, pick it up in verse 2. He and his disciples come to his hometown, Nazareth, and he began to teach in the synagogue. And it's interesting, if you look at Luke chapter 4, verses 16 and following, you can read the account of what happens in the synagogue. Because what's typical is a visiting rabbi would come and they would actually invite him to teach. And so he comes to the synagogue and they actually... Um, he actually calls for a scroll, and the attendant brings him the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads Isaiah 66, 1, and stops right in the middle of verse 2, where it moves on to then what it becomes fulfilled in the, his second coming, and he stops right there at that particular point of the prophecy and says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. 
it's clearly a messianic claim because it's a messianic prophecy, and he's claiming to be it. Mark just dives right into the theological com color commentary and starts explaining what's going on. He starts explaining that these people are actually shocked by Jesus' ministry. So there's a lot of shock and awe in this passage. There's shock and awe on the part of the, of the people because they're shocked at Jesus' ministry. There's shock on the part of Christ because he's shocked at their unbelief. So let's just look at the people, first of all. In verse 2, they start asking questions from 2 through 3. These are the questions that they're asking. Where did these, this man get these things? Where, where did he get all this? And they're, of course, they're talking about ability and teaching. I mean, he has incredible insight. He has incredible clarity about the Old Testament scriptures. He even has prophetic gift. And he has overwhelming power. Notice what he says here. Where did the man get these things? Specifically, what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? I mean, they are not lacking for miracle evidence. Everybody, even in Nazareth, knew what had been happening in Capernaum, in Cana, and on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. This is not that far away. But look at verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? The brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And it just goes on to relay all of this very, very personal information. Obviously, the people who are in the synagogue that day, the hometown crowd, I mean, they know who this is. Oh, it's, it's little Jesus. He grew up with us. And his brothers are here. James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, was obviously saved later. Judas, the author of the epistle, Jude. The other two we don't know anything about. His sister's unnamed. But you can imagine what that would be like. Hearing this miracle-working, messianic-claiming guy that you grew up with. And you're thinking, I... This is Jesus. I mean, yeah, Joseph, I remember back in junior high, we, had to, we served detention together. I mean, the amount of familiarity that they would have growing up with Jesus' biological family is already paving the road naturally to disregard his truth claims. And so, verse 3b says they took offense at him. And the word is, Scandalizo. The scandalon is a stumbling block. It's something that causes you to sin. It leads you into sin. It's a stumbling. They're hearing truth. They know about the miracles. They know what he's done. They're hearing what he's claiming. And they're stumbling. I want to give you one quick cross-reference here. Listen to 1 Peter describe the nature of stumbling. There's a, there's a theological reality about stumbling. And so when you think of this word, um, uh, and scandal in the English word scandal usually has a lot more connotations than would in the uh, original Greek. Um, obviously, it's, it's where we get the word. But to, the scandal here is a, is a stumbling. It's, it's a cause of offense. It's a cause of sinning. It's, it's something that can ensnare you. It can trip you up. And notice the theological explanation of how this works. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, he talks about the precious value that is for you who believe. It's only for those who believe, the precious value of Christ. But for those who disbelieve, and now watch this, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, and it says, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the, the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And that word there, offense, is the same Greek word uh, that Mark uses to describe how the hometown crowd responds to Jesus. They, they took offense at him. They find that him offensive because he's so familiar. But watch what Peter says. Theologically, here's an explanation for how this offense works. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And probably even the better translation here would be they stumble at the word because they aren't persuaded. And to this they were also appointed. To what were they appointed? To that connection. The word doom is added, and you can just ignore that, because that's not a helpful addition. To this, it's just a neuter pronoun referring to the previous concept. And so the idea is, when somebody hears truth, 
and they are not persuaded by truth, they find all of those claims that go along with it to be an offense. They're going to find all of those truth claims offensive. They're not going to have anything to do with it. You can't possibly listen to Christ and be partial. You can't think, yeah, he's a good old boy. He's a hometown guy. Like, I like him. He's great. He, he went a little too far. That's what, these, that's what the hometown crowd thought. That he just went a little too far. Three chapters ago, that's where we were at. Here we are, chapter 6. And now they're taking offense at him. They're stumbling at the word because they were not persuaded, because they were not obedient. They didn't yield to it, and so everything about it becomes an offense. He becomes an offense. The message becomes an offense. Of course, they don't have the luxury, like what happens today in a, uh, many professing Christians who, who today would just simply say, I don't have a problem with Christ. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, this passage and his scriptures and yada, yada, yada. And they distanced Christ from his word. Well, they didn't have that luxury because Christ was there in person. And so what he said was who he was. And we, of course, don't have that luxury either. Nobody has that luxury. But that's what's said today. We think we can separate Christ from his words sometimes and minimize the offense. Um, if you're ashamed of Christ or his words, you're offended by him. In the hometown crowd here, they are offended. They know the family. They know Jesus. He is way too familiar. In fact, Jesus says to them in verse 4, um, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And that's just a, an axiom that becomes true. You, you might as well just say familiarity breeds contempt. They're very familiar with Jesus. They know his family. They know his mom. They know his dad. They know his occupation. They know his siblings. And they know the trouble they got into as kids. They know all of it. And so they just disregard it. Our Kent Hughes once told the story when he was um, in Cambridge and the cab driver started volunteering some political views that were, uh, were not asked for. And the cab driver just, this is uh, back in the 80s, and the cab driver said, well, I'm going to vote for Margaret Thatcher. And he said, but the one thing I don't like about her is her middle class accent. And our Kent Hughes was listening to this cab driver talk, and he said, now this guy certainly wasn't talking with a Cambridge-Oxford quality of English. He was middle class. And he just went on to remark, it's interesting how sometimes we just don't like people coming from our domain, socially, demographically, or have what, what have you. But seeing somebody rise up. And there's, an, there's a contempt here to the point that even Mark records he, verse 5, could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He did next to no miracles compared to what he had been doing. And that's, a, that's an interesting statement. Um, I will say this. It's important to understand this statement. It's important to remember that Jesus often healed people apart from the sick person's faith. It's, he often did that. He is the Messiah. He's reversing the curse. And that just happens throughout the Gospels. One example would be Luke 17, verses 11 to 19. I think I mentioned it last week. Ten lepers. He heals all ten. Only one comes back to worship Jesus Christ. And he says, go, your faith has made you well. All were healed of leprosy. But only one's commended for, for faith being delivered from his sin condition by virtue of faith. One out of the ten. All ten healed physically. So it is not the issue that physical healing only comes by faith. That's not the issue. That doesn't, that, you cannot account for the biblical data by saying that. However, what's also true is that where we're at in the Gospel of Mark is we are in the midst of a bunch of stories where Mark has been piling up uh, the power of faith and how it's combating fear. So just real quick review. Go back to Mark chapter 4. Look at verse 40, after calming the, the windstorm and saving their lives, he says to the disciples, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Skip down to the story of the demoniac. Remember the people from the, the town on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. They came out in verse 15 to see the demoniac who had formerly been demon-possessed. He was sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became terribly frightened. Verse 17 after they hear the account, they begin to beg Jesus to leave their region. Meanwhile, the demoniac 
wants to go with Jesus. He says, no, stay and become an evangelist. He does it. He just walks on forward in faith and says, I'm going to do whatever Jesus tells me to do. Last time we saw the story within a story. Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and his daughter who was sick and ended up dying. While the story, inside story happens, namely the woman who had been um, bleeding for 12 years. And um, verse 33, the woman who was bleeding, uh, who had been bleeding but healed, she was fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her. She came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go and be healed. Then in verse 35, the servants come from the synagogue's house and they say, your daughter died, don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus hears that. He overhears them talking privately to Jairus and says to Jairus, don't be afraid any longer, only believe. He keeps exhorting them, continue to believe. It's not too late. And then he goes and raises her from the dead. Shows up in Nazareth. The miraculous legacy of Christ is documented. It's undeniable. His teaching is clear. It's profound. He is claiming in no uncertain terms to be the Messiah anticipated for a millennia plus from the Old Testament's perspective. And they're offended. They don't want anything to do with him. And if you read the account in Luke 4, even commends the faith of Naaman, a Gentile, and they try to throw him off the cliff in, uh, after he taught in the synagogue in Nazareth that particular day. And so Mark just documents he didn't do any miracles there. He couldn't even do miracles there. They weren't believing. And so miracles in the face of that kind of rejection of special revelation would serve no purpose. And here's the point. Verse 6. He wondered at their unbelief. Jesus is shocked by their unbelief. He's marveling. I mean, this is in a long list of a lot of shocking things happening in Mark. This is one of a kind. Let me just quickly read you the list. Mark chapter 1, verse 22. The people were amazed at Christ's teaching. 2.12. They were all amazed at Jesus' teaching and His healing of the paralytic, so they were glorifying God. 3.21. They were saying that Jesus was Outside of his mind, he went berserk. He went too far. He's lost his senses. 5.20, everyone was amazed because of the things that Jesus had done for the demoniac. 5.42, uh, they saw the girl walking who had been dead, and they were completely astounded. In our passage, chapter 6, verse 2, the people who heard him preaching in the synagogue were astonished. Chapter 6, 51, after Jesus calms the um, the wind, and they, he gets into the, after he stops walking on water, jumps in the boat with them, they were utterly astonished. 737, they were utterly astonished. 1026, they were even more astonished. 1118, the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. 1555, Pilate was astonished that Christ made no answer. 1544, Pilate was astonished that he would have been dead at that time already. There's a lot of shock and awe happening in this gospel. This is the only time Christ is shocked. He is amazed at unbelief. Is there anything so shocking as unbelief? We're talking about of course, unbelief, rejection of special revelation, rejection of truth, rejection of the message that God gave. What could be more shocking? To think that God, who created all things, would speak to his creatures, and a creature would not believe it, would question it, or even imagine that I'm supposed to decide whether it's true or not? I mean, we have some forms of theology in the American church today that actually feed the right of man, the, the autonomy that we think we have to make a decision. Oh, here, we just present the truth, and then you have to decide. Well, sure, certainly everybody does make a decision. But where do we ever get off imagining that we had the right to make a decision? God speaks. Shocking if anyone doesn't listen. Christ is shocked. 
He can't believe that they are not receiving it. He can't believe they're not embracing it. He can't believe what they are doing in their hearts because God has spoken. He's spoken through Him. Here's the Messiah showing up, documented evidence, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy after Old Testament prophecy, performing signs, wonders, and miracles that could not possibly be performed if He were not the Son of God. And they don't believe. What's so astonishing about unbelief? What's so astonishing about unbelief is what it says about God. Let me just give you two passages to to think about why Jesus was so astonished. Let's start in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 33. John writes this, He who has received his testimony, that's Christ's testimony, has set his seal to this that God is true. And that when you hear the word set his seal, that phrase, to set your seal, you know, think of like a, a seal or a signet ring or an actual seal of a king you would press into the hot wax that becomes the seal of like a scroll. I mean, that's the equivalent of saying, yep, I, I validate this. It's the equivalent today of signing your name on the dotted line. You're signing your name on the line. Here's the statement. Here's a formal document. And the document says, God is true. Faith takes the pen and says, signs my name on the dotted line, absolutely, God has spoken, it's true, I'm taking his word at face value. The opposite of that is obviously unbelief. Look at what John says later in his, his epistle, 1 John chapter 5, look at the corollary here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Watch this. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. What is unbelief? Unbelief is taking a formal document that says God is a liar and picking up the pen and signing your name on the bottom on the dotted line. We do that every time God speaks and we stand uh, not quite committed. I don't know about that. That might be too far. That warning's too severe. I don't know if I'm going to act on that. If we're exposed to truth and we decide... We're not going to act on it. It's the same as taking a pen and signing a formal document that says God's a liar. Are you shocked and appalled at your unbelief like Jesus was? I was thinking about this this week, looking at my own heart, my own life, and looking at the text, and it was just I was thinking about the text started coming back to me, just thinking about the nature of unbelief. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of excuses we might make for unbelief. Sometimes we might say, well, I, it, belief would be easier if God gave me more evidence. Belief would be easier if God gave me more evidence. Just encourage you to read Luke 16 again. Read the story of Abraham. Lazarus, and he goes to Abraham's bosom, and he's just rejoicing. But the, the rich man, The rich man goes to torment. And he says to Jesus, send send back Lazarus because I don't want my brothers to come to this place. And Jesus says, they have Moses. If they don't believe what Moses said in Scripture, they're not going to believe if somebody rises from the dead. That's a lie. To think that we would believe, that belief would be easier if we had more evidence. You're signing your name on a dotted line. God's a liar. He didn't give me enough evidence. He gave you more than enough evidence. He gave you biblical evidence, which is more sure than somebody rising from the dead. Uh, Sometimes you might hear what I even mentioned already, people separating Christ from his word and say, "Uh, I don't have a problem with Jesus. I just have have a problem with this passage. Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 8, if you are ashamed of me or my words, then my Father will be ashamed of you when I return. 
sometimes people say, I do believe this truth, just not that truth. You know, that's a classic move of every, of every false teacher. To extol a truth that they're going to uphold on paper to meanwhile discredit something, dismantle something, or attack something else over here. Or sometimes you might find your heart even flattering yourself about your faith because you say, I do X, Y, or Z. Meanwhile, you might not be doing all that God's called you to. Of course, I don't want you to walk out of here insinuating, thinking that if I'm not obeying perfectly, I'm, I'm just a through and through unbeliever. But I am asking you to examine yourself and say, do you excuse unbelief by looking at areas where you do obey God? These are several ways where we often flatter ourselves with our unbelief. And I, I, just, I think this story is so unique because it so clearly documents Jesus' shock and astonishment at the sheer audacity of unbelief. And believers, you know there's such a benefit here to this story because then we have the benefit of actually looking at our hearts and acknowledging, wow, wherever there's resident unbelief in my heart, that is just shocking. I should be so shocked, overwhelmed, amazed at the audacity that I'm capable of in unbelief in my heart. And if, you are, if you're not a believer, your life might be marked by not taking God at His word. There might not be anything in your life that you could say, here is where my life has been radically conformed to the will of God apart from what it used to be naturally. If that's, that's you, then... Christ is shocked and appalled at your unbelief, and by His grace, He's showing you how appalling your unbelief really is this morning. And so let's thank Him for doing that. Father, thank You so much for this text. And as we, um, as we just bask in what You've done this morning, as we think about the testimonies of these brothers and sisters, as we think about this text in Mark 6, as we think about what it means to, to believe, and we think about the shocking nature of unbelief, Lord, I do pray that we would walk out of here sensitized this morning. As we sing this final song, I pray that we would indeed adore you and worship you for any conviction that you are bringing into our lives, areas where we are not persuaded, where we have not yielded, where we are not coming under what you've said. And thank you for the conviction that you bring through, the, through your word and how it refines us who believe. It accomplishes its work in us who believe. It's living and powerful and active. But Lord, I also just want to pray. And in light of what we saw in verse 5, where Jesus, even in his earthly ministry, experienced the limiting capacity of being around the rejection of truth and the rejection of your glory the rejection of your message. Lord, I know that anyone here who this morning is, is not receiving your message, is not embracing what you say about them, is, not, is refusing to self-indict where you are indicting their heart. Lord, we know that this is patent unbelief. And it's, it's shocking and appalling, and it's completely inappropriate and condemnable. And thank you in your grace for sustaining every soul who's here in this room to hear another testimony of your character, even, even a unique story like this, where it's the testimony of your son's shock and astonishment at how grotesque unbelief really is. And I pray that we would have some of the same response to the, any resident unbelief in our own hearts this morning. So Lord, as we, as we sing this song to you, I do pray that it would be an expression with brokenness and expression from a standpoint of, of imperfection, from a standpoint of, of believing but helping our unbelief, I pray that we would sing these lyrics as an expression of, of faith. So I pray that you'd be glorified and honored as we worship you as your church this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.